It is 12 o'clock on Tuesday, February the 14th, the Day of Love. The House Criminal Justice Subcommittee is now in session. Madam Clerk, please take the roll. Representatives Campbell, Davis, Here. Gillespie, Here. Hardaway, Here. Howell, Holsey, Here. Johnson, Here. Lamberth, Moody, Here. Russell, Here. Cheryl, Here. Towns, Chairman Doggett. Present. Chairman Doggett, you have a quorum. Thank you, ma'am. Members, any personal orders before we begin today? Seeing none, we'll go to our Sergeant of Arms, Mr. Tyler Munez, for his weekly words of wisdom. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Today's words of wisdom are coming to you from the hunk of love himself, Elvis Presley. <laughs> don't criticize what you don't understand, son. You never walked in that man's shoes. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, members, we've got a calendar here. We're going to jump right in. Uh, item number one, House Bill 1031 by Representative Hurt. Okay. You uh, are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I'm here today to present to you House Bill 1031 on behalf of Speaker Sexton. Members, if you remember back last year, we had a, a tragedy in Memphis, the Liza, Fletch, Liza Fletcher tragedy. And in, re, in response to that, an ad hoc committee was formed to look into maybe what could have been done or um, things that led to that tragedy occurring. And one of the main things that jumped out was that the accused perpetrator in that case had over 50 TDOC violations and he was still released four years early. As a result of that, this legislation is brought before you. Currently, prisons across the state have their own disciplinary boards to determine the awarding and reduction of credits for sentence reduction. This legislation creates a statewide autonomous inmate disciplinary oversight board to oversee the re recommendations of each current disciplinary board for awarding and removing credits for sentence reduction in accordance with state law. Basically, this board that this legislation is looking at creating is a full-time autonomous inmate disciplinary board that can grant or deny inmate sentence credits for good institutional behavior as well as to determine whether sentence credits previously awarded should be removed due to a major prison infraction. The board would be composed of seven members Two appointed by the governor, two appointed by the Speaker of the Senate, two members appointed by the Speaker of the House, and one member that is appointed jointly by the Speaker of the Senate and Speaker of the House. The purpose of the board is to oversee the current disciplinary board recommendations for awarding and removing Senate's credits. There are limited policies regarding, regarding the disciplinary boards for each state prison. For example, the Turney Center Industrial Complex has 54 disciplinary board members, while the West Tennessee State Penitentiary has six members. Creating a statewide oversight disciplinary board promotes public safety while ensuring across the board that each case is treated under the same rules. So basically, members, this legislation creates a full-time autonomous inmate disciplinary board to oversee current disciplinary board recommendations for a awarding and removing sentence credits. So with that explanation, Mr. Chairman, I'll renew my motion. Thank you very much. Uh, first on our list is Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative, thank you so much for carrying this on behalf of the speaker. Um, it's it's gonna really, really help uh, what's going on, uh, not just in Memphis where I live and the people that I represent, but um, I think it will also bring some comfort to uh, my friends, the, the Fletchers and the Orgles and that entire family. So I just want to thank you, and uh, I'm in full support of this bill. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I guess I'm curious. Um, definitely was an issue in this situation, and um, 
somebody it was is necessary to look at those credits and all of that but is there not a requirement we can make with the current organization to to cover this rather than creating you know s spending millions on this new oversight committee um, it looks to me like is there a possibility of something that we can already do um, making certain requirements with the current uh, groups that see the oversee this or that do this and manage them better is that a possibility? Thank you for that question. But I would say that, that having one autonomous board that oversees to, to make sure it's all looked at from the same view across the state, each individual situation would be much better than trying to amend or change with the, for example, the 54 members on one board and six on the other. Um, trying to just let them do their thing, but having one autonomous uh, board to overlook it would be more balanced. What about research and, and, and data on this and how it might work in other places? Has this been done? Has it been shown to be successful? Anywhere else? I don't have that in front of me, but I can find out for you and get you those answers. Thank you. Thank you, members. We've got uh, one person here that uh, would like to testify on this bill, so uh, we're going to go out of session. <laughs> hear from Ben Rabin, if that is correct. Uh, if you would, uh, you, there's a little button on that microphone you can push. It'll turn red. Introduce yourself for the record. You'll have three minutes for your comments. All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ben Rabin. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I'm here on behalf of the Tennessee Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, we have some significant concerns um, about the impact of this bill for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, I believe that this would be basically an impossible undertaking by the review board. Uh, there are about 28,000 inmates across the state that are currently serving sentences in our jails and prisons. Most of them are getting uh, credits of some sort or could earn credits of some sort. Um, and this bill contemplates that this review board will review each and every set of credits uh, that may be earned by the inmates that are earning those. And so if we assume that um, all of those 28,000 inmates are having a review done each month, and it takes a minute to review each of those inmates' records. Uh, that comes out to about 117 hours per week if we just spend a minute on each one. So if we have a 40-hour work week for this review board, um, and again, it, it less than that, but it's going to be well above 40 hours a week, I think that this is going to create a tremendous backlog of credits being approved for inmates who are earning those. And that's going to hurt inmates who are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're earning credits. They're good, having good behavior. But because those credits are not being able to be approved in a timely fashion, that's going to create a backlog. And it may create delays of when inmates are going to be released who are earning those credits, but they're not being calculated by TDOC because they haven't been approved yet. I think the costs will be substantial. The uh, fiscal note on this bill estimates $2 million, which is just for the review board itself. The, the fiscal note says that they can't calculate the actual cost for increased sentences um, due to a number of unknown factors is in the review note, which I think should be the first red flag that they can't even estimate how much additional time uh, inmates will be serving if they're not getting the credits that they may be getting now. I looked on the TDOC website again. They estimate about $79 per inmate per day. If you crunch those numbers, if we make the most conservative estimate I could think of, that if we just have one less day per month per inmate, uh, which it could be well above that, that's $26 million a year. If this causes just one day per month per inmate um, to be uh, to, to, to not get credits for those time, And so that $26 million rough estimate could be substantially higher by many magnitudes. TDOC already has regulations on the books that say that you can only get good time credits if you're not getting write-ups, if you're not in maximum custody or punitive segregation. We already have records on uh, rules on the books that TDOC has, and if those could be enforced better, I'd suggest that we should start with that instead of creating an entirely new apparatus of this board um, that will be stuck with basically forever that could have um, significant unintended consequences and costs. I'd be happy to answer any, any questions. Thank you for that. Members, do we have any questions for our guest? Representative Hardaway. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you for being here. Um, what's the purpose of these credits? 
The credit, the, the purpose of the credits are to incentivize uh, good behavior um, that inmates have, you know, a sentence of, let's say, 10 years with eligibility for release after a certain percentage. Um, and the idea is by having good behavior, taking classes, um, not getting in fights, doing what they're supposed to be doing, then that can allow them to shorten their sentence, which helps the inmates and the uh, correction staff and everybody. So if we're looking at taking away or confusing or bottlenecking the incentive for good behavior, what can we expect the impact to be on a system that's already short of security guards and oversight uh, of the inmates already? I think that that question presents some really troubling um, thoughts of, of, you know, if inmates are no longer having those incentives that if they stay out of trouble, they can uh, shorten their sentences. Um, mm -hmm. And the, you know, what this bill does is it allows the review board to basically make their own rules of what constitutes good behavior to get those credits reduced or, or to, to earn those credits that right now we see what TDOC has. If you don't get write-ups, if you're in minimum security, things like that, and we don't know what the review board will put in. We don't know when those credits will be allowed um, to people who are maybe earning them. And so if inmates don't feel like you can actually get a benefit for good behavior, then we don't know, you know, I think studies have shown that, that uh, violence in prisons and things like that goes up when they don't have those incentives. And the violence impacts the inmates, the violence impacts our security guards. Absolutely, and I know that in, in both state-run and private prison facilities across the states, there's huge staffing issues, and I would certainly think that, um, you know, the staffing issues themselves create issues as well as the violence of, of you know, dealing with inmates who are not behaving, um, and, and if that increases, I, I would certainly expect that to um, lead to further staffing issues, which will just promote more issues of, of getting inmates to behave, because the more staffing there is, the more uh, corrections officers available, I think, the, that creates a deterrence for inmates uh, to act better as well. It's sort of a cyclical um, thing that compounds on itself, and I think that it could kind of create exponential problems. All right, and, and I appreciate you being here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have, uh, we have murders and kidnappings of, of uh, women in Memphis and Nashville and Knoxville and Chattanooga on a regular basis. I want to do something uh, about it but I don't want the community to be under the false impression that we're delivering uh, help when in actuality uh, we're not sure what we're delivering. And I, I'm really concerned about the risk factor uh, for the inmates and our guards uh, who it, it's already difficult, Mr. Chairman, to. Uh, to hire enough and to hire qualified uh, guards already. So I'm, I'm concerned because there's some answers that we just don't seem to uh, have for this bill. So I have a concern going forward. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Leader Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I know we know each other, and thanks for the job that you do. I, I want to be clear, and, and Mr. Chairman, if you can put back on the list, I'll make comments when we're, when we're out of session back on the bill. But on one hand, it seems like you're arguing that this system is going to be so strict and, and make it so clear to inmates that unless you earn the credits, you're going to lose them, and it could cost the state, I think you said, $26 million. And on the other hand, it seems like you're saying that a system that is strict and has a very specific you know, pathway to credits is somehow or another not going to be beneficial to keeping pace people safe within the prison. I'm just trying to figure out which one it is. Because, I mean, all we're talking about is a structure here that has oversight on a system that has failed the people of Tennessee. Um, this system hasn't worked. And, in fact, the horrible situation that my colleague from Memphis just mentioned is proof positive of someone who behaved reprehensibly in prison and yet still got good time credits. Um, I, there's a young lady I've been trying to help for years who the man who killed her husband in front of her sent her letters continuing to stalk her from inside the prison, and yet got good time of behavior credit the entire time until the federal government finally prosecuted him and he got convicted of it. And we're still trying to get him to take away his good time of behavior credit. It still hasn't happened. So these local boards are not working as well as they should, and this puts another level of oversight in it. Most of what you said, I agree with. I want there to be a very, you know, very linear path for folks that are in prison to be able to earn these credits. 
but I also want it to work well to protect everybody else, both that works at a prison and are outside of a prison. So if you can, help me understand the two distinctions and kind of what I'm hearing you argue on both sides of this. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I think it would be good to have more data. I mean, we have anecdotal evidence on both sides. Um, and I've talked to inmates who feel like they are behaving well that maybe aren't getting the credits they should. And then we have people who we've seen aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and are still getting the credits. Uh, but I think that I'd be certainly interested to know, particularly for fiscal notes and things like that, of how many is it on both sides? I mean, we should have the data of how many write-ups they're getting because um, at least under the current system, one of the, I mean, it's pretty rigid about if you have class A write-ups, if you're in minimum versus maximum, and all that data should be out there, and I think it would be helpful to see what that data is, to see, you know, what's happening and also why it's not happening. And I think that, you know, talking to TDOC, you know, if you have these policies, are they not being followed? Why are not they not being followed? And I think part of the concern I have is the creation of a new administrative body that's going to create more bureaucracy, more backlogs, and will make things maybe worse instead of better. And I think if we can try to simplify it, what's going on? Is there not an automatic process? If you get a class A write-up, I mean, could that not be put in the computer and mm -hmm. you know, flag something in the, you know, electronically where you don't even need a human to do it mm -hmm. instead of having mm -hmm. this whole bureaucracy to review things and you're asking the wardens and the sheriffs to do more work, they're creating more paperwork, it's getting sent out. And is there a way we could actually make it more efficient instead of bigger to ultimately get to, I think, the same place that we're all looking for? Okay. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you. That, that makes sense to me. I mean, basically, look, you just, uh, kind of the unknown here, and that's the reason kind of both sides of this, I can hear the argument. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Towns. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, uh, the Chairman actually um, kind of helps me to segue into what it is that I was interested in. How can you make this particular system better? Because some of the, what he shared with me, I'm familiar with, uh, those cases and the young lady that has been trying to help for a while. But do you see angles for additional policy that could be introduced that could make it better as we speak? And have you all collaborated and talking about how to do that? Um, we'd, we'd love to, to collaborate. Um, my organization of criminal defense lawyers, we're always happy to meet with uh, members and, and brainstorm and come up with more ideas. Um, this is something that we've seen relatively recently, and so we're still trying to get our heads around it. Um, but I, I would, I mean, personally think that maybe an internal, you know, within TDOC approach makes the most sense of one, just find out what the data looks like, what's going on here, and is there a way that we can just in, enforce the existing policies better um, and maybe have some sort of review body of some sort, but have it be to look at what's going on, make sure that things are being followed, as opposed to what this is, which is a higher separate board that everything has to go through for approval, um, as opposed to just making sure that what's there is being followed. And I think that um, there's all sorts of ways that internally uh, agencies can, you know, see what's being done, see what can be made better, and I think this is a perfect example of um, a way to, to do that. Mr. Chairman, do we know how, how frequently good uh, behavior credits are, are used in uh, our Tennessee system today? Um, well, I, c I can tell you what the policy says about basically if you're, if you're not getting write-ups and you, know, you get credits for that, uh, you get more credits the longer that you've been in without getting write-ups. Um, if you're not in maximum uh, custody, things like that. And so um, you know, I can see what those policies are, but what I don't know and what I'm not sure, I mean, certainly with the fiscal note reviewing the data, we don't seem to know um, exactly how many people are getting how many credits and how many there are maybe not supposed to be getting them that are. Um, I'm not sure if that, if those numbers have been crunched, but I think that'd be very helpful to see. I'd like to see those numbers myself to see how frequently it's being used. So if you know right now, what, the, what is this process now? What do we do if I want to give someone uh, good behavior credits, who's doing it, who's reviewing it, what happens today as we speak in our system? Um, I, I don't know the, the, the ins and outs of it. I mean, I know that TDOC is solely responsible for administrating that. I know that it's done. Um, they, they have, you know, calculations and things like that. Um, but I, generally speaking, I think the default is that they would be getting credits, but if you commit certain violations, then those can be taken away, basically, either removed to credits you've earned or to not earn and say you would have been getting this many credits, but because you've gotten write-ups or you're in, you know, administrative segregation, we're not going to award you those credits, and TDOC is doing all of that. Mr. Chairman, do, do we have TDOC here today that can answer my question? 
Uh, yes, sir, we do. However, they are not on the uh, list for testimony, so I would encourage you to reach out to them after the committee is over with and they can get you those answers. Okay. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, let's see. Um, I'll wait to hear some of, some of the other debate, I guess, on it. Yep. Testimony. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess to, to go a little bit further with um, my colleague who talked about behavior inside and how without that incentivi incentivization that perhaps it would be worse than, than normal. And I know that um, or somewhere around 90 percent of incarcerated folks will be released at some point. Um, there's also research that we have from a, a, quite a wide body of research that shows if those incentives are just randomly, you know, are taken away and not given, that what we see is if there's no incentive inside, a lot of people don't take classes and our community is less safe when people are released because they didn't do those things. Is that a concern here at all or? Absolutely, that would certainly be a concern um, that I would have and clients that I've talked to. I mean, most of the people who I talk to for parole hearings and things like that, I mean, they want to do good, they want to do everything they can for when they get in front of the parole board to say, hey, I've, I've had good behavior, I've gotten all my credits, and because they want to see that reward, basically, and I think there's carrots and sticks, basically. You reward good behavior and punish bad behavior, and I think it's just human nature, basically, to, to create incentives, and if, especially if you take away the possibility of incentives that they have now, and they learn, hey, I may not be getting these credits after all, um, I think there's a real risk of, of bad things happening. And, and kind of back to my question to the sponsor as well, because I feel like there are more uh, tighter restrictions we can put on the current boards to solve this problem. Do you feel like that's also a possibility? Or? Absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of this can be looked at internally of how is this being done. And, and uh, I think the review boards typically are the ones who are deciding, have you committed a violation or not? You know, if you've had drugs, if you had cell phones or whatever is sort of what they're doing. And then from there, that should be triggering automatic um, either loss of credits or failure to get credits that you would otherwise be getting. And that seems like that's where the breakdown is. It's not necessarily that, I mean, people are getting write-ups all the time for if not doing what they're supposed to be doing. It seems like the disconnect is, is that then resulting in the, the failure to get the good behavior credits that the policy say that they shouldn't be getting if they get in trouble? Any other questions for him, Representative? No. Okay, thank you. All right, we're gonna go back into session. Thank you for your time being with us today. I've got uh, a couple more names on my list here. Representative uh, Holsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to clear up some of this, um, and, and by the way, Tennessee Department of Corrections has a monumental, monumental task that they keep up with and, and do most things quite well. What came out of this ad hoc meeting was a discovery that sentencing credits are automatic. They just occur automatically. And if somebody behaves in a poor manner or, and I'm not talking about they spit on the sidewalk, I mean, pretty serious things. They only lose sentencing credits for one month, that month right there that this offense occurred in. And then they start again the next month. So when this came up in Memphis, of course, the issue was with all the things, 20 some odd offenses that were serious offenses, how did sentencing credits keep on going on automatically and why did he only lose one month when, when he committed these offenses? So I, I think that those recommendations came out of the ad hoc committee to do what we could do to fix that. So I, I would suspect that the majority of this board's time will be looking at removing sentencing credits for wrong and wrongful behavior rather than focusing on the average inmate that doesn't commit crime while he's in there. He does obey the rules and that kind of thing right there. But that's that was the impetus that started this whole ball rolling to start with. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. I th and think you're exactly right because this is not about not awarding <laughs> credits for good behavior. It's on the bad behavior, on the over 50 violations we saw, he was still released, you know, f four years early. 
um, or how, it was four years early. So I think it's more about what kind of teeth are in the penalties for the violation. So thank you for that. Representative Moody. Thank you, and Spencer, I do want to thank you too. Um, you know, when we heard that news, it it changed, it, it brought up a lot of conversation with within our families, within our friend groups. Um, it, it was truly terrifying and shocking to think that something like that could happen. And so I think I'm thankful for your bill because, you know, the worst thing is for that family to always have that what if. What if this had been taken care of promptly? So I think... Um, I, I just want to thank you for bringing that bill and let you know that it's it it was a terrible shock to our, our whole state, the country, and this is a way for us to show the country how we can do things better. So thank you, Leader Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the sponsor of the bill. Thank you for bringing this legislation. <laughs> I appreciate both you and our speaker um, leading on this, and it it really did. I, I appreciate Chairman Holsey chairing those committees over the summer. And it just was obvious there needs to be more oversight here. Um, it just, it, it should never be that it, these credits are being either awarded or not awarded without really good supervision and oversight over it um, to ensure that it's being done properly. I mean, that, that's our role is to make sure that the people of this state are served well and specifically in this realm um, that they're kept safe from folks that have committed sometimes some very heinous crimes. And look, if, if under the law they've earned that good time, then they should get it. But if they hadn't, they absolu absolutely should not because every day that they get good time credit that they did not earn is a day earlier that a violent felon is released into our communities to go on and create a new victim, which is exactly what happened in Memphis and has happened throughout the state from time to time. Again, if they earn the credit, fine. They, they absolutely should get it. But if they don't earn it, they, they should not get that credit. This just provides for that oversight. I can't imagine how anybody vote against it. Thank you. Uh, Representative Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you for bringing the bill. I appreciate that. I do have one question, and I'm just trying to do the numbers in my head. Uh, and I understand the genesis of this bill, which was a travesty. It really was. And we have to do something about oversight. But in looking at the numbers we have between uh, county and state prison facilities, we have about 28,000 inmates and this is a seven-member board. I'm wondering administratively, how are they going to uh, uh, sift through this data to find out who gets what? Administ can you walk me through that administratively, how this is gonna work? Because they're gonna have to depend on some help from somewhere other than the board themselves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you for that question. That's a fair question. And it absolutely is, will be a monumental task, which is one reason it's a full-time board with um, uh, employees underneath the, those board members in order to sift through the, the huge number of violations and cases they would have to look at. Um, and, and that's a fair question. We had a fair question earlier that, that we need to get some information on. And Mr. Chairman, if you would allow me, I appreciate the discussion, but um, in consultation with the speaker, and with T with T Doc, I would ask to roll this bill a week. All right, thank you very much. Without objection, roll uh, ten thirty one one week. <laughs> Item number Mr. Chairman, Representative Hardaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the sponsor, uh, I appreciate the intention and and where you're trying to go with this, and it may very well be that you get enough information and that you put it into a, uh, a style that I can actually support. But I appreciate uh, you accepting the challenge to collect more data. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, item number two, House Bill 290 by Mr. Chairman Kiesling. Motion. Thank you. you are properly recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Before I dive into the, my text, Mr. Chairman, I would like to express, as you said, this is a day of love. 
and I want to express to you my love, Mr. Chairman, as long as, as also to each of these committee members. And of course, I'm hoping for a positive outcome <laughs> on this legislation, <laughs> needless to say. But House Bill 290, Mr. Chairman, it does, it is relative to diversion, to the diversion application. If you will recall, members, during their, uh, during Governor Lee's first year in office, he called for, and the state legislature, we unanimously passed the elimination of the state expungement fee. We recognize that by removing financial barriers, we can help first-time offenders get their life back on track. This bill is simply a continuation of that. The bill would eliminate the, uh, currently the, the bill would eliminate the $100 application fee for a diversionary or divisionary, diversionary program for first-time offenders. Diversion is exclusively for individuals with no prior convictions, and that's very important, no prior convictions. This fee is currently being assessed to people who are seeking a second chance, literally. There are two types, just as a reminder, there are two types of diversionary programs, uh, the pretrial and judiciary. Both are used to give defendants a chance to avoid a criminal record upon a criminal defense Defendant's request for diversion, the defendant must pay, again, the $100 in order to obtain the application for certification of eligibility for diversion, which is a document completed by the TBI as a prerequisite. And finally, members, you may recall that this is the same bill. Many of you that sat on this committee, the same bill that received near unanimous support last year, but we failed to secure the funding to implement the bill, and as you see at the at the uh, physical note, you can understand that. But you may recall that this, um, but we but we do hope that this hopefully can be addressed this time if we if we can get to continue to get movement on it. So at this time, Mr. Chairman, I will entertain any questions, and I might add, uh, members, that uh, the chairman has worked with us just in case there's we do have. Uh, I uh, do have some someone here in in order to uh, give some testimony or questions if uh, if I can't. So with that, again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Representative Towns had a question for you. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I'll, I'll, I'll just wait for a second, if you don't mind, please. Representative Hardaway. Thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, sir. It's mighty fine looking tie you got there. It says Thank love you, all sir. day. You've always been very complimentary, yes, sir. sir. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, to you, I might add. Well, thank you very much. And just, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's, I know I'm out of order taking a, a personal moment uh, at this time, but this bow tie is Miss Barbara Cooper's favorite bow tie, and that's why I wear it. Uh, wonderful. Uh, and unlike in the past, I'm not going to untie it to prove to her that I can tie it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that, that little uh, bit of uh, deviation from the, uh, the, the routine here. But um, to the sponsor, when these individuals who cannot raise $100 uh, are able to uh, get their record clear and move on and start paying taxes and um, contributing, becoming uh, real contributing citizens uh, in society. Uh, can you expound on that for me? Well, it, of course, this was brought to me by, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the gentleman here with me today is Mr. Evan Wright, Attorney Evan Wright, I might add. And he has seen this day in and day out in his practice there in Fentress County. So, uh, I, quite honestly, I'm not kicking the can on you, but I think he'd be better uh, to, to address that question than than I, if, if granted uh, permission to for testimony. Yeah. Well, uh, but you would agree that the more uh, that we're able to put folks back on the right path, 
put them into situations where they're self-sustained, the better for you, me, and the rest oh, of the society. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That, that, and I'm, I believe in this legislation. I think it's it's the right way, the right track to go with many of these folks. Matter of fact, with all of them, though, that's, uh, that's, that's seeking this. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I, I think, Mr. Chairman, we'll see well more than $100 in savings uh, when we just look at the contributions to society that these folks thank are going to make. Yes. So I, I thank you for that. I wish that was reflected in the uh, the fiscal note. So I'll, I'm going to give you a, a verbal amendment to that fiscal note. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, sponsor, for the bill. Thank you, uh, Representative Towns. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, a couple of things. Um, first thing is that uh, while Ms. Cooper loved that bow tie, it wasn't the member that she loved the best. I just want you all to know that. <laughs> I, I was the member that she loved the best, okay? And, and <laughs> Mr. Chairman, representatives spreading love around. Uh, who on the dais do you love the most <laughs> up here? I just want to know. Am I forced to answer that, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> you don't want to do it. <laughs> I'm not in state committee this week, so <laughs> you don't have to answer. You no. don't want to do it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I think it's a good bill, sir. Thank you, sir. Love I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions for the sponsor on the bill? Seeing none, I think we're ready to vote. All those in favor of sending House Bill 290 on the full criminal, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes prevail. You move on to full criminal. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman and members. Very kind. Members, we're going out of order here to... We're going to item number six. Item number six, House Bill 482. My Representative Boyd. Motion. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman of the committee. Uh, House Bill 482 uh, uh, delves into a statute that deals with a tax on our critical infrastructure. And what it does is it, it seeks to raise that from a Class C felony to a Class C felony. And it's uh, really that simple. We've seen in recent years, uh, uh, particularly about the time of the, this year, at the same time as the blackouts that we experienced because of the weather in North Carolina, there was a, uh, an attack on an electrical substation that brought down a utility there, and we've started to see this more on the West Coast. And so uh, we recognize that critical infrastructure is just that. It is critical, and we want to stiffen the penalty to ensure that if people break that crime, uh, they will uh, experience a harsher punishment. Mr. Chairman, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Representative Towns. Thank you. It's good to see this bill. I have something similar to dealing with our infrastructure, but I think uh, since that trend has started around the country, we need to figure out uh, some additional measures, I believe, to try to catch these guys before they do it. Because as you indicated, it, it's an impact on all of us, and it's very, very dangerous. And I think we've had, within the last two or three months, maybe what, two or three attempts? that I'm familiar with that made the news. It could be more we don't know about. But I think we're going to have to do some other things to, um, as, as opposed to on the back end penalize them, to figure out how to track and prevent this before it happens. Good bill, though. Thank you. Response? Uh, appreciate the endorsement of the bill, uh, Representative. Representative Davis. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Representative Boyd for bringing this. My question has to do with specifically about critical infrastructure. Would schools be included in that? And the reason why I ask that is because um, I can see seniors doing donuts on the soccer field and you know that's more than a thousand dollars. So that's kind of, I don't want them to be charged with a higher level felony of just being a stupid kid. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, schools would not be considered infrastructure. Representative Holsey, Chairman Holsey. Thank you. Um, to the sponsor of the bill, I, I got a little bit of problem here. Um, you, you've got a, a monetary value of $1,000. You can commit vandalism up to $1,000. It's a misdemeanor. And yet, if you commit $1,000 worth of damage under your bill, now it's a class C felony. Um, to me, that is pretty inconsistent in the in the whole structure of of the categories of of crimes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so I, I should have clarified that we're leaving that section alone. If it's a thousand or, or less, it will remain the Class E felony that it currently is. It has to be a, uh, the damage has to be greater than a thousand dollars for it to fall into the uh, Class C category. Oh, okay, I still have problems, and the reason I say that, somebody spray paints uh, the side of a wall, and it takes fifteen hundred dollars to clean it off they're then charged with a Class C felony. Is, is, is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, this would be the destroy, no, the, the, this would be the destruction or sabotage of critical infrastructure. This is not vandalism. This would be, and, and almost any crime that would be done in this category would probably exceed $1,000. But what the bill seeks to do is to go after those people that would bring down our electrical grid, our, our fresh water supply, uh, natural gas supply, and, and so that's what the bill is seeking to do. And, and so we recognize that there was a $1,000 threshold, or, you know, that if we made that a Class C felony, that was going to be problematic and would probably get thrown out in court. So we left it where it currently is, which is a Class C felony. So this only applies to charges greater than that. And I, uh, you know, there would be the discretion. I mean, the, the prosecutor would have somewhat discretion. It doesn't guarantee that it's a, a Class C felony, but they could go that high if they wanted to. Okay, thank you. Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To the sponsor, I must say that as someone who's carrying a little infrastructure bill this session, um, I appreciate your bill and I'd be glad to sign on to it. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I got your interchange with the other representative about the $1,500 example. And you were saying that would be discretionary or it would could still be considered a class E felony. The, uh, the prosecutor could, could go as high as a class C, but it's not a guarantee that, that it would, that they would they pr pursue that with prosecution. Yes, but then it's possible. It is possible. Thank you. Later, Lamberth. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I share one of my one of our chairman's zeal up here on this piece of legislation and strongly support it. I just think critical infrastructure ought to be off limits. Um, it has such a devastating effect on a community if a transformer gets taken out or any other part of critical infrastructure that, that goes way beyond what the damage to that item is. And so with all due respect to a certain other chairman up here whom I dearly love and is wonderful, and I say that on Valentine's Day purposefully, um, I'm going to agree with the chairman furthest to my left and just say I really support your bill. It's, it's a fantastic piece of legislation. Thank you for bringing it. I do have one question for you. I know that we've made changes to critical infrastructure uh, sections of the code over the last few years, but one of the things a, a representative standing in the back of the room last year added uh, into critical infrastructure, I believe, agriculture, um, that would raise the threshold there or anything over $1,000 of damage of crop damage would be punishable as a C felony. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, uh, the, we, we actually printed this off just to be clear. As used in this section, critical infrastructure includes, but is not limited to, the, the various things that I'm about to say, and that is telephone, telegraph, television, internet, other telecommunication services, electric, heat, natural gas, or other power energy sources, the distribution of crude or refined liquid petroleum products or natural gas, the pipelines, pumping stations, terminals, equipment necessary for operation of this facility, water, wastewater, or sewer services, railroads, and other transportation services. Then section two of that says farm has the same meaning as defined in and includes real property, vehicles, equipment, machinery, animals, or crops contained on a farm. Section A. So as drafted, your bill would apply also to, to farms, agriculture. Reason I asked, someone spray painted a tractor, which is completely inappropriate. It would be well over $1,000 to have that repainted and I don't know if that catches the spirit of what you're seeking to do I, I know conversations we've had and I apologize I didn't catch this until just now but I know that we had talked about transformers and you know electrical grids and things like that were things that we had have been considering you know this um You, 
you want a response or are you are you good go with the it intent it was not to was, was not farm it was what we consider critical infrastructure there in uh, section b or, or uh, subsection one there is defined there i mean i i do see now as i look a little further that uh, apparently it was amended to put uh farm in there i mean we could we could further amend this bill if we needed to to uh, to clarify that, and I'm happy to roll it a week and, and address that with the committee. Chairman Hosley. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, just so we don't mix up the wrong things with the intent of what you got. And by the way, it would be a Class B felony if you cut the cable to the leader's television and he couldn't watch Gunsmoke, so I'll just tell you that. <laughs> Representative Towns. I think we're on the right track. I think we might, Mr. Chairman, clean it up a little bit so we can get exactly at what you want to get at and what we need to get at. But I know we don't want to, uh, you know, kids getting up painting and costing $2,000 to redo it. That's not our target at all, I would imagine. That's not what we're, we're not after that. So I, if you, do I need to make a motion? If, if, if you're good with one week? Mr. Chairman, I'd love to roll it a week and work with the committee and, and anybody that has questions to clarify that. Well, I'll make a motion, Farm Mr. Chairman, question. so he doesn't have to use his roll. Well, all right. well it, it'll still count, but it's okay, all right. Really? We, without objection, we're going to roll House okay. Bill 482 one week. All right, thank you, sir. Don't run off. you got number 21 on the calendar. <laughs> House Bill 484, uh, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This deals with the theft of catalytic converters, which, as we all know, has become something of an epidemic, uh, not only in this state but uh, across the country. I know Representative Gillespie has worked on this in the past, and we have created over the last few years legislation that would ultimately become model legislation for the registration of scrap metal dealers and, and how they operate in our state. Uh, this last year, I put together a task force, and we invited the TBI, the Department of Safety, Commerce and Insurance. We met with the Sheriff's Association, Police Association, and the scrap metal dealers. We sat down and we discussed this, and we, at the end of the day, no matter how many bait cars or no matter how, how well you coordinate and all the training that you provide, ultimately, if it's just a misdemeanor, there's only so far you can go. So it seemed to be the consensus among the group that uh, the theft of a catalytic converter needed to be uh, raised from a Class E, I'm sorry, a Class A misdemeanor to a Class E felony. Mr. Chairman, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for the sponsor, Representative Towns? Representative Johnson. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, how much does a catalytic converter cost? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the, if a catalytic converter is, is stolen off of your car, it could be size $1,500, $2,000 to replace, although the street value to the, uh, to the criminal might be $200. And so it's, it's the precious minerals that are inside of them. And it is important that we recycle catalytic converters. A lot of the precious minerals that are extracted from them are, are not mined, or it's very difficult to mine them. So, um, you know, the, the collection of these catalytic converters from muffler, muffler shops and the recycling of them is very important. Uh, in the precious, precious minerals industry. However, uh, we do not want to condone the theft of these. And so we've, like I said, a tremendous amount of work has gone into this over the last few years. And I, I've got, a, I've got a, a shout out to Representative Gillespie for carrying that legislation, but uh, we're in a good shape and uh, as far as the scrap dealers and how they're regulated and their requirement to register with the local law enforcement if they do uh, set up an operation. But we, at the end of the day, we've got to hammer down on these criminals. And this is a lot higher than just petty crime. This actually, there's a lot of criminal uh, interstate uh, criminal families that are involved in this. And so uh, the law enforcement said that, that raising it to this would put enough pressure on the petty criminal uh, that they may turn state's evidence on a larger crime operation that's going on uh, nationally. And so I think this may, uh, may help uh, curtail the theft of these catalytic converters in this state. Yes, ma'am. I guess, I guess my concern is, is there any data or research to show that this has worked? Um, somewhere when tried. I'm, I, I really am concerned about, I, I don't know about all these folks are going to know about this bill and it's going to be preventative in measure. So is there something that shows this has been done and it's worked? And um, also with the legislation just put in place for the metal dealers and the tighter restrictions there, have we given that time to work before we take this measure? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Tennessee kind of leads with a catalytic converter legislation. And so uh, I imagine a lot of people are going to be looking to, to do what we do here today. And so I think we're, we've led the charge on the, the legislation that we passed a couple of years ago. And I think we're leading on this issue as well. So no, there's not a state that we're looking to on this being criminalized uh, further. Okay, thank you. So there's no evidence from anywhere else that this has been effective. Mr. Chairman, uh, no, no, this is, we're leading on this issue, Representative. Thank you. Representative Towns. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Speaking to what we did a couple of years ago, I was a part of that and I participated in it to raise it from where it was to make it 1129, okay? Uh, the challenges I have is this, is that we have, while theft of anything is wrong, if you steal a bubble gum out of the store, all is wrong. It is indeed wrong. Catalytic converters with the metals, we know they're recirculating them. But I got a concern of uh, it being considered a felony when we don't have enough room for some of these guys that are out raping, robbing, and murder, murdering folk. It's a problem because this is uh, 1129 should be enough to actually get a guy's attention. Once you get a felony, these young people, they could be 17, could be 18, I don't know. I have not looked at the data. But once they get a felony, if they come out, we're not going to hire them. It's going to be another problem. They're going to have to either graduate their theft or do something because we won't accept them back as we should hold skill into the community. It's not solving the problem. As a state, there are many uh, hard criminals out there that are doing things, carjacking with a gun, murdering, molesting of a child, rape. We need space in the cell block for those people in particular. I'd love to see some data too. While I supported it the last time, I have a big concern about making this a felony. Now, tell me this at this point. You may have the, the data in your mind. If not, Mr. Representative, we would love to get it. What is the number, what is the increase from the time we did the bill to make it 1129? What's the data today saying have we increased even more or level off or decreased or what, if you have that data in your head? Mr. Chairman, I don't remember when it was changed to uh, misdemeanor class A. I, I'm not, I'd have to look and, and research that. But I will tell you that you make a great point, except it's not getting their attention. Uh, law enforcement is telling me that they are, they are raiding houses for, for other issues, could be drugs, could be prostitution, and they're going in there and they're finding rooms that catalytic converters are stacked from floor to ceiling. And these things are being peddled because of their precious minerals, a lot of the way that, that drugs and other things are peddled. And so this is not uh, petty crime going on here, Representative. This is, this is organized crime. And so what this seeks to do is to put some pressure on the folks that are, that are caught in the process of sealing them or people that are, that are caught uh, with these uh, and paraphernalia in their possession. And we're, our hope is that it will put pressure on the prosecution of the higher level crime. Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate that. Therein lies another point, as we know, and you're, you're right. Uh, we have laws on the books as it relates to murder. There are laws on the books as it relates to rape. Murder happens every day in this country and in this, and in this state. And we can increase the penalty, but it still occurs. And this is the reason I'm saying we need space for those guys and, and people that choose to go to the far end of the spectrum. Now, all of it is wrong, I'm saying, uh, the, you know, stealing, and if it's a ring, uh, your car or whatever, that's still wrong. It's definitely wrong, but uh, I don't, I don't see how this is going to stop it. What about penalize the folk that are buying the metals, more so too? Somebody has to, like we did with the pawn shops many years ago. They were receiving and fencing all this stolen stuff, but it's going straight to the pawn shops. So we changed the laws with the pawn shops. Uh, are, are we looking at it at that angle as well? And I'm familiar with people who've gotten their stuff stolen. My neighbors. A catalytic converter was stolen. Came out one morning to go to work, car won't start. And it's, uh, it's a problem. It is a problem. Thank you for those comments. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to add some insight to this, but now I'm just going to call the question, please. All right, question's been called. Any objection? Seeing none, we're now voting on sending House Bill 484 on the full criminal. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? No. 
The ayes prevail. If you wish to be recorded as a no, please see the clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman of the committee. All right, let's go on a journey back to item number three, House Bill 75 by Representative Whitson. You are Thank recognized. Uh, there's an amendment with your bill. Code 3309, is that correct? One moment. That is correct. All right, you're recognized on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. Um, this is an administration bill from the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services under the direction of the wonderful Commissioner Marie Lee and her team, uh, Marie Williams and her team. This legislation was proposed by the department's statewide planning and policy council. In 2021, there was 30, over 3,800 drug overdose deaths in Tennessee, according to the Tennessee Department of Health. Drug overdose can be reversed if timely medical assistance is administered to the person experiencing the overdose. In 2015, in an effort to encourage people to seek life-saving assistance, the Tennessee General Assembly passed a Good Samaritan Protection Law that offered immunity to individuals who call 911 or otherwise seek medical assistance for themselves or others due to a medical or a suspected drug overdose. The immunity applies to the arrest, charge, and prosecution of simple possession or casual exchange or unlawful drug paraphernalia uses and activities. Under the current Tennessee uh, Good Samaritan Protection Law, this immunity applies to a person experiencing a drug overdose only on that person's first drug overdose. This bill, as amended, would keep the immunity of a person experiencing a drug overdose for their first such drug overdose, but would give the responding law enforcement officer or the district attorney general's office discretion whether the immunity should be extended to that person for any other drug overdoses in the future. When an individual survives a drug overdose, they have an opportunity to receive or seek treatment or other recovery support uh, activities, and they recover from the disease of, of addiction, repair relationships, and make a positive impact on their community. This bill has no fiscal impact, Mr. Chairman. With that, I renew my motion. Thank you. So your amendment makes the bill? Yes. Okay. Members, any questions on the amendment? Question has been called. Any objections? Seeing none, we're voting to adopt uh, Amendment 3309 on to House Bill 75. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, the ayes prevail. You adopt. We're on House Bill 75 as amended. Any questions, comments for the sponsor? Question has been called. Without objection, we're voting on sending House Bill 75 on the full criminal. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, the ayes prevail. You move to full criminal. Members, item number four, House Bill 1242 by Representative Powers has been taken off notice. Item number five, House Bill 557 by Representative Littleton is rolled one week. Item number seven, House Bill 1008 by Representative Grills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee. Uh, I actually brought this bill last year, but we, like uh, Chairman Kiesling mentioned earlier, did not get it funded. So we're gonna give another shot at it this year. Um, this bill adds that a course of conduct for the purpose of stalking includes one instance of placing an electronic tracking device on a person or in a person's property unless the electronic tracking device is placed by or the direction of a law enforcement officer. Uh, this, The genesis of this bill, there was a young lady who, uh, worked at Chick-fil-A and come to me one day and she said, you never would believe what happened to me this morning. Got in my car and uh, on my way to work, my phone goes off and there was trying to uh, connect to something that was on her car and we'll come to find out someone had put a device on her car and it was tracking her. And as I've done a little more digging, that some, it seems to be a common problem across the country. And uh, we did not have uh, any way to actually address that in our code. So what we're trying to do is just add this course of conduct. I renew my motion. Thank you for that explanation. Are there any questions for the sponsor? I see Representative Hardaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the sponsor for the bill again. Is the uh, the fiscal note 
of $13,800 for fiscal year 23-24, the same as last year, or within that ballpark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's a little bit less this time. You know, it's, I support your bill. I just don't understand how we can't appreciate the investment to save lives, to save a lot of times you're going to find that these instances are, are domestic uh, yeah. uh, violence and sexual assault uh, driven. And I don't understand how we can't fund this bill. I'm voting for you, Bill. I'm supporting you all the way. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Towns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here again, thanks for the bill. The bill itself, what becomes the penalty if it passes? Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, it's, Representative Grills, you're recognized. It just, it just uh, creates a course of conduct which puts it in the stalking uh, code. And then it will be charged as stalking. Got it. Thank you, sir. Any other questions for our sponsor? Questions been called. Any objections? Seeing none, we're voting to send House Bill 1008 on the full criminal. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, the ayes prevail. You move on to full happy criminal. Happy Valentine's Day. Hey, happy Valentine's Day to you. Item number eight, House Bill 281 by Representative Baum. Second. You are recognized there is an amendment with your bill, Amendment Code 36. Eight five is that correct? Yes. You wish to proceed with that amendment? Yes. You'll need a motion and a second on the amendment. You are recognized on the amendment. Okay, thank you, Chairman Doggett. This bill was brought to me by the Tennessee Municipal Judges Conference. Currently, we have st in state statutes provisions that would allow individuals to expunge from their records um, certain um, misdemeanors, misdemeanors and certain felonies. But the Tennessee Municipal Judges Conference does not believe that Tennessee state law currently allows municipal courts to expunge from municipal records certain local violations. This bill would allow municipal courts to expunge from their records certain violations. And the kinds of local violations that this bill would pertain to would be things like uh, parking tickets, uh, some traffic violations, um, uh, city codes violations. With this bill, there's a set of procedures that is outlined and specified that would allow a municipal court the authority uh, to expunge those types of local violations from an individual's record. Thank you. Any questions for the sponsor on the amendment? Seeing none, the amendment makes, makes the bill. Is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> We're now voting to adopt Amendment Code 3685 on House Bill uh, 281. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Aye. Ayes prevail. We adopt our own House Bill 281 as amended. Any questions for the sponsor? Leader Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, uh, we haven't spoken about this bill before, but on this particular issue, it, in the amendment, I was trying to double check, is it still just say 30 days after they're found guilty of whatever municipal offense that they would be able to get an expungement? Yes, it's 30 days after the individual has uh, satisfied the requirements of the court in terms of penalties, fees, things like that. The period is listed as 30 days instead of a longer period. Uh, at the recommendation of the Tennessee Municipal Judges Conference because these are things like parking tickets or ordinance violations rather than more se uh, serious offenses. And, of course, none of these would include any type of criminal offense. But, yes, it is a 30-day waiting period. It just seems a little unusual to me. I mean, 30 days after a municipal judge says, you know, this person's done something wrong, just wipe it all off the record. I mean, what's the point of even finding them liable for it to begin with? I mean, just get the fees for it or something? I mean, that doesn't seem like a good reason. If it's important enough to find them liable for it, 
it seems to me at least that longer than 30 days would be appropriate, but, uh, you know, whatever the committee thinks is best, it's not a huge deal one way or the other, but 30 days seems pretty quick. Just my opinion. The uh, individual would have to pay fines, as you mentioned. The individual would also have to go through the trouble of going through the process to get the item expunged from the municipal records, and so there would be uh, a time commitment by the individual. So it, it'd be a little bit of a hassle. There'd be a little bit of a barrier to, to getting this done. Uh, but it, it's not a waiting period of five years or something like that, because again, this, this may just be a, a parking ticket. And the implications of having a park a tic parking ticket on your record may be so minimal that a lot of people don't even bother to go through the process. But this bill would allow municipal courts the authority to provide these types of expungements if they wanted to, if they thought there was merit in it. And of course, the court can always turn down the, the petition for the item to be expunged. Any follow-up later? Uh, Chairman Holsey. Thank you, Chairman. I, I like to build because in current, there is no way for anybody to remove those, and you can't remove driving violations because they go on your driving record. But I understand from my former city attorney that some of the open alcohol issues, possession of open beer, those kind of things, particularly with somebody he told me that was going to go into a sensitive position in the military, they wanted to, that they wanted that expunged from the record. And this provides an avenue for them to do that. So I appreciate the bill. Representative Towns. Look, look I like the I like the bill, but I can curb my leader down there. Thirty days is not long enough. What if you got a lady that's pregnant, and she may want to, after she deliver a baby, uh, get caught right in that time frame, and she goes to court? That's too late. Thirty days is just not a long time, and you specifically indicated the gyrations that one has to go through in order to accomplish it. It is not a long time; it goes by like that. Um, but the bill, I think, on its face and how it's presented, is something that perhaps we need to do. But I think we need to look at a little longer than thirty days, man. Maybe Stand I with. should. Thank you. Maybe I should add that the bill does not mandate these violations be expunged after 30 days. It just allows the municipal court the authority to, to, to expunge beginning at the 30-day mark. The court may decide 30 days is not long enough and, in fact, turn down those, kind of, those kinds of petitions. This just begins allowing a municipal court the authority to even consider it uh, at that point. But it may be that judges agree with you all and they feel like 30 days is insufficient, maybe it needs to stay on the record for a year. It's just that uh, the, the consideration begins at, at 30 days, but it's not a mandate. Well, as long as that's distinguished, because as indicated, if you got someone trying to get a job, you know, they don't want that on the record for a chance at a great job, it may take them two months, three months. I'm not saying a year, what have you. If the judge has the flexibility and, they don't, and they're not precluded from Ruling in, in a uh, citizen's favor after 30 days is which what I'm hearing. I'm thinking that after 30 days, uh, they can't really hear it or make a ruling that will expunge the record that you may have. That's the way I understood it. Now, if that's not clear and clearly accurate and they have the flexibility to do it, now legal may have to look at it and tell me, but I'm reading it uh, a little differently. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask that legal. Uh, give me some clarification on it. All right. Without objection, we're going to go out of session and hear from legal services. Michelle Fogarty, legal services. The bill says that the court may grant the petition um, if at least 30 days have elapsed since the completion of the penalty. Got it. Which is going to be the beginning time for them to consider it at that point a person can file a petition and if at least 30 days have elapsed since the completion of the penalty that was imposed the court can go ahead and grant the petition right so it's not as constricted as i thought thank you any other questions for legal while we're out of session see now we're going to go back into session representative towns are you you got any other questions before we move forward all right. Representative Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just for clarity to the sponsor, 
if a petitioner requests expungement within, within 30 days and the court denies it, they can come back at a later date and petition again? Yes, and okay. just to clarify, the petitioner must wait 30 days. After the 30-day period, they may petition. The court can turn them down so that the 30-day waiting period is not something that, uh, that uh, entitles the offender to expungement. That's just the time period that m must elapse before the court can, can even consider it. And the court then, as you suggest in your question, can turn down the petition. The petitioner can come back at a later time, though. Thank you. I do have a question for you. So um, this is not automatic expungement. It's not automatic expungement. In fact, it sets out a, a set of procedures that must be satisfied before expungement is even a possibility, before someone is eligible for expungement. But it may be that the court never expunges. And also, most of these offenses are going to be things that are fines only, like parking tickets, having your grass growing too high, may have a couple of cars that don't run parked in the driveway or in the yard or something like that. that is that what we're talking about? Correct. These are local ordinance violations. They are all civil. They include no criminal violations. Okay. Thank you. Leader Lamberth. Mr. Chairman, I don't know about everybody else, but that sounded very specific. Is this, is this question time or was that confession time? <laughs> Someone call question on the bill. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Question's been called. Any objections? Seeing none. We're voting on sending House Bill 281 as amended on the full criminal law. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? <laughs> the ayes prevail. You move on to full criminal. Thank you all. Item number nine, House Bill 427 by Chairman Clemens. You are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and happy Valentine's Day to the committee. I can feel the love in the room, especially down here on this end. I don't know about that end. Um, I'm glad Baum got you good and warmed up on this subject, but this bill deals with expungements. And right now, as you know, there are expungement timelines of one year, five year, and 10 years for various uh, offense, criminal offenses for expungement. What this bill seeks to do, or what it does as currently drafted, is eliminates that waiting period. Um, now, I've spoken to the TBI, I've spoken to criminal court clerks, and, and some of you, and some of you raised some valid concerns that I, that I take to heart. And so what I'm going to do, after I speak for just a moment, if you will, Mr. Chairman, indulge me, uh, I'll take this bill off notice with hopes of bringing it back uh, with an amendment perhaps next year, because I really do want to shine a light on this subject, because the five-year and 10-year waiting periods, and speaking with individuals who are directly impacted by this, as well as criminal defense attorneys and others, I, th those timelines are very long. That seems like an exorbitant amount of time to have to wait before you can even begin to petition. Not to mention the fact that that five-year and 10-year timeline is restrictive. So even if a court or somebody wanted to do something before then, they are expressly prohibited the way the, the law is drafted. We're having a real issue with people being able to get jobs and employment. And if we want individuals who have proven themselves, financed their, you know, to be good members of our society, they've been rehabbed, they finished their sentences, having to wait five and 10 years is prohibitive for them. That is a certain hurdle for them to gain employment. And as we all know, employers still look at that criminal record. Um, and, and take that into consideration. But if someone has, has served their time, they, they've done their job, uh, they've become active members of their community, we should not be prohibiting them from contributing to our society. And I'm afraid the timelines currently in law um, actually do that. They, they prohibit them from being able to get out and make some money and support their family and, and do what we expect of good citizens to do to contribute to the community. So what I would like to happen is for us to really have a thoughtful conversation about this, uh, you know, across the aisle and whoever um, would like to be involved and really think about some timelines that actually work, not only for the court system and, 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 and you know, with issues with regards to post-trial issues and things like that, 
um, and come up with a more realistic timeline because five and ten years seems like an awful long time to try to arbitrarily say, well, they've proven themselves after five years they're a good citizen or ten years they've proven themselves. I, someone could probably prove that in a shorter amount of time, so I'd love for us to have a conversation and, and really think about shortening those timelines down to something that's more realistic and reasonable to better allow individuals to reenter our communities and society. And with that, I'll answer any questions on this issue, or, um, or I'll just go ahead and take it off notice. It's up to the pleasure of the chair. Representative Hardaway, did you have a question? Uh, Mr. Chairman, not so much a question as a comment. I think that at times we can get too binary cookie cutter on how we set uh, penalties and how we design the ability for our uh, individuals who have paid uh, their debt to society to be able to reenter society and to move on that path. Some are ready uh, far sooner than others. And there are a lot of things that can happen in between the time that you're ready. And that um, really, I, I guess, is an arbitrary uh, number. I remember looking at the, uh, the statistics, the data, on what that 10-year uh, mark means as far as those who are not going to reoffend. And it, it, it wasn't convincing for me at the time. So I welcome a graduated um, uh, time frame. Looking forward to talking about your bill when you bring it back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you, Representative Hardaway. I, I, yeah, I think there needs to be a, a little bit more leeway and discretion once these petitions are filed. I understand there needs to be a certain amount of time, perhaps, but there does need to be some discretion on the court's part. and and take every specific um, individual's circumstances in, into account and see if we can't, you know, really accomplish what was intended with these expunctions on the front end. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Representative Towns. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Here again, I think uh, the bill has merit and uh, I'd love to see it come back as well, uh, especially when you're gonna have some time, in some cases where you have people that are they're kind of mature in age and they still may want to try to get back in society where they should want to try to get back. So I look forward to seeing and hopefully get a chance to work uh, as a collaborative and find out what would be reasonable. Mr. Chairman, thank you. You, you think, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, and exactly. I mean, if you got an 18-year-old who, you know, makes a dumb mistake and steals a pair of jeans or something or that, that they need, you know, and then requiring them to have that weighing on them for five years or however long, it, it's just... Doesn't make sense. I, I, I think we really need some some leeway here and some discretion. So thank you, Representative Townsend. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for our sponsor? Seeing none, without objection, we're going to take House Bill 427 off notice. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 10, House Bill 104 by Representative Parkinson will be rolled one week. Item number 11, House Bill 22 by Representative Chisholm. You are recognized. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. I brought to you House Bill uh, 22. Uh, this bill re re requires law enforcement to initiate an audio-visual audio recording when interrogating uh, a minor. Um, I would like to thank uh, the TBI, the Sheriff's Association, and the Association with Chief Police for their input on this bill, and I stand by for you all. Thank you. Leader Lamberth. Representative, here's, here's my question. So in looking at your bill, if it requires an audio or video, um, what happens if the audio or video is not recorded? So someone, uh, someone under 18 is speaking with an officer, they admit to a murder. They give a full confession, feel horrible about it, and they tell them about it. But it wasn't audio or video recorded. What happens under your bill? So, th so this bill does leave. Uh, so this bill would not apply if there is a an extreme circumstance. For example, uh, if law enforcement officer has to uh, have to do uh, have to interview a, a juvenile at the scene of the crime, or uh, in the case you just spoke about. 
Well, I understand that your bill says under exigent circumstances, that's fine, or if there's some kind of technical glitch. I'm just talking about an SRO was talking to a kid in a school, and they bust out and say, look, I know y'all been looking for a guy who did this. I did it. And they give a confession. I, maybe I should have made that a rhetorical question. I'll tell you what happens in all actuality. That confession is going to be tossed out if we pass this bill. And I don't think that's your intention. It certainly wouldn't be, I think, our intention. But if you make it a requirement in law, and, and it, it is absolutely something that is best practices and policy and that every officer should do. And, in fact, I think most of them do. But if we put it in the law, that confession is not going to be admissible in court because there's only two exceptions in here. I mean, it, a technical glitch, basically, um, where they thought it was recording, but it didn't, or exigent circumstances. I, I just can't support that. Um, that's my issue with this. I, again, policies and procedures saying, look, that they should do this and everything else, all that's fine. But when you go to put it in the greed books over there, if that law is not followed, my concern is some victim of a heinous crime out there is going to go free when there's an absolute confession to the crime. So um, I appreciate the spirit in which the law is, is brought, um, but it, it's just not something that I could uh, support just for that reason. Thank you. Thank you. Any response? Uh, yes. Uh, so this bill is merely an extra layer of protection for both the juvenile in question as well as the officer. With this bill, if we if we cured one lawsuit, this bill has done its job. Um, so again, this bill uh, ensures that um, if there's a if, if a juvenile is being interrogated that ensures that the officer is doing the things they should be doing, and it also ensures that the juvenile is doing what, what they should be doing as well. So no one could have room to say something happened that did not happen in the interrogation. Thank you, uh, Representative Towns. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Lita Lambert, uh, this question is to you. Uh, with your, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know, long-standing technical knowledge. Uh, I wonder if there's anything that you see that we could actually include by modifying this bill to make this bill a workable bill to figure out how to get at the concern that we see. Leader. Yes, sir, and thank you, my friend. We've been friends a long time. I mean, if you require that there be a policy and procedure on recording this information, and, and we say that every department has to have that type of policy, that's fine. I mean, you know, you, you can violate a policy, and sometimes there's good reason. You know, I mean, again, someone just walks up to you and starts talking about something, and you just, you know, don't have time to turn the recording on. It can happen and does happen in the real world. But if, if you put it in the law and it's not followed, that, I mean, that's what's going to happen is the video auditor is going to be cost out of court and should, by the way. This legislature, when we create a law that says you have to do this, yeah. if you don't do it, then there should be repercussions for that. And unfortunately, within the within the you know criminal procedural realm, that's normally what the remedy is. So some sort of policy procedure, I mean, is, is a great idea. Okay. But saying statutorily they have to right. um, will create, I think, more problems than it, than it solves. Mr. Chairman, so technically we could solve it or get at it very closely by uh, ensuring that we implement a policy that addresses it versus statute is what we're saying. <clears throat> and, and, and with that policy, uh, obviously, people are sometimes going to miss the policy, but it'll, it'll increase that thing, high, I'm pretty sure, high up in the 90, 95, 97, 98 percentile because it's a policy and still addresses the same thing. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess a couple of questions. One, has this bill passed in the Senate? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, it has. Okay, and my second question, um, in reference to what my colleague was talking about, that situation where there might be an admission, I mean, I, I can appreciate having it on recording because you would know if there was coercion or anything like that, especially when we're talking about young people. Um, that is also a concern. And so, um, like my other colleague, I feel like we should be able to find some area where where these two things come together because certainly you want to make sure that there was no coercion in a in a confession and this audio or videotape would would do just that. Yes, uh, th thank you for that. 
Uh, and again, we, we, are, we are talking about children, and we want to make sure that um, we're not doing anything under the table with children. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative, thank you for uh, bringing this. I was just, I may have missed this, so I apologize. Um, would this only apply to a t an interrogation of a minor in a, like, police station, or are we talking about something going on out on the streets? And then I've got two follow-up questions to that. Okay, yeah, so this bill primarily uh, talks about when there's an interrogation. However, there are, um, there are situations where this will not come into play. Just for example, uh, if a juvenile has, a, has unruly conduct at a school, well, uh, the, the school administrator or school resource officer would call local law enforcement at that time. Okay, uh, and I, I'm assuming there's just some other factors that can play in there. I guess what I'm getting at is uh, at least I, I don't know how it is in other counties throughout the state or municipalities or whatnot, towns. Um, I know like where we are in Shelby County, most officers carry on the street body cameras, but in some certain cir circumstances, their supervisors do not. So if a supervisor were to encounter a minor out on the street, what if this bill passes and is, becomes law, what, what takes place? What, how does that, how is that impacted? Because I, I see there's not a fiscal note. I'm just a little concerned here that are we gonna force these departments to buy cameras for every single officer from the chief of police down? Or what, what's, what's happening there? Well, did this bill, this bill primarily talks about when they're, we're conducting a formal interview. Thank you. Sorry. So just um, I'm still unclear if we're talking about on the street or in the interview room in the police substation. Yeah, in, in the interrogation room. Okay. Thank you. Representative, I, I do have one brief question for you. I will say that we are running out of time, but under the way this has been written, this is when a child has been taken into custody due to the suspicion of a child committed delinquent act or unruly conduct. Would that also include a juvenile who was driving? 12 miles over the speed limit, they were stopped by an officer. Would that, would that require them at that point to have audio or visual recordings of them while they are talking to that child? I, I would have to get that answer for you. Okay. T, we're going to be out of time, and I think that there's been some issues that have been raised today that would I think could really take on some more looks. So, Representative Hardaway, briefly. Thank you, Chairman. But in looking at the language, it, it seems to me to clearly say a formal interview or interrogation of the child at a law enforcement facility. So, I, I, that's all I have. Tell you what we're gonna do, if it's all right with you, we're going to, uh, this bill is going to be rolled one week. We're going to roll all the bills that we have not taken up. That's fine. So this, this will not count against you as a, as a roll. But uh, before we do that, Okay, so this bill, including all remaining bills, with the exception of House Bill 1159, will be rolled one week. House Bill 1159 will be taken off notice. And we are adjourned.